South Africa is a leader in many agricultural products, but especially in the global mohair industry. A humble workshop located in the rural areas between the port cities of East London and Port Elizabeth of South Africa not only uses locally sourced quality mohair, but is also dedicated to the economic empowerment of rural women. This morning, we get to chat to Adele Cutton about this exciting venture. Then, we get to meet another achiever in Grain Essay's Grow for Gold competition, Clinton Frey from Winterton. But for now, over to Lisa for the latest news. In the, today's news, the chairperson of SAI, Dr. Theo Dayaga, recently received the 2021 Agricultural Oscar Award. This prestigious award is given annually to a person who broadens the horizons of agriculture in Zimbabwe. Dayaga was honoured by the Commercial Farmers Union of Zimbabwe for his role in negotiations between the CFU and the Zimbabwean government regarding compensation to victims of expropriation. These negotiations led to the Global Compensation Agreement of 30 July 2020. The award also recognises the way in which De Yaga has represented Zimbabwean farmers at the World Farmers Organisation since 2017. Constantia's Glenn's winemaker Justin van Wyk has been presented with the 2021 Diners Club Winemaker of the Year Award. This is in recognition for his Platter's Five Star Bordeaux style blend, the Constantia Glen 5 from the standout 2017 vintage. The Winemaker of the Year Award is regarded as South Africa's most prestigious and well-respected wine competition. This year's award honours the country's best winemaker of a Bordeaux-style red blend. And Dr. Rafael Kurwai is leaving the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. After 10 years at the JSE, he has now been appointed as the Chief Executive Officer of the Agricultural Bank of Namibia. This institution is a state-owned enterprise equivalent to the Land Bank in South Africa. Kurwai joined the JSE in 2012. A personal highlight for him was when the JSE introduced formula-based methodology for calculating location differentials. And that's today's news. Adele Cutton has managed to build a highly successful high-impact business that celebrates the much sought-after mohair found on Angora goats. The focus is not industrial production, but rather to operate in a niche market with a wider range of colors and yarns that cannot be made by industrial machines. But let's find out more. Adele, thank you for joining us. You are a pioneer in South Africa's mowing industry. Tell us about the history of your startup. Um, well, it was a hobby. Um, and the hobby was um, encouraged by two grandmothers who were amazing at handwork. And so I grew up a around a lot of knitting and embroidery. And they were both came through the world wars. So they, they saved everything, they recycled everything. And so that was in my system already as a young girl. And um, my first knitting project was a rainy Christmas for a, um, my grandfather. And my grandmother took out all the old yarns and we selected colors. And that was my introduction. Of course, the fairies came in the middle of the night and helped knit it so it would, you know, grow a little bit more. And I think it must have taken a couple of Christmases uh, before it was finished. I don't have recall of that. But the important part about that was that my grandfather wore this wiggly scarf that got bigger and smaller and fatter and thinner. And uh, he wore it every day of his life 
after that. And as a young girl, I just thought I was the best knitter in the whole world because my grandfather wore that funny scarf. So that was the background to it that why I always was a knitter and I was always involved and then um, just was so disappointed with the range of yarns that was always on offer. So I, I then thought, no, come on, there has to be more to life than, than these boring yarns. And that was when I um, started, you know, creating and inventing. And my hobby was spinning because as a university, um, when I finished university, I was lucky enough to travel and work in the British Isles. So I got to see the woolen mills in Scotland and go to the Shetland Islands and see the people spinning for the Queen and you go to Wales and those sort of things. So I was totally inspired by that. And I thought, why don't we do something exciting in South Africa? And, you know, with no end game in mind, I just basically started. And so this little hobby of mine grew into um, a little business. And that was basically how it started. So what does your business entail exactly? Well, now we have several facets to the business. We make knitting yarns and we also um, make knitted garments. So we use those old fashioned hand knitting machines that grandma used to have. Um, and we use those and we knit blankets and scarves. And so we have a range of sort of more accessories and a few home um, products. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the the knitting yarn range. So it's sort of two sections um, to the business. And then there's the big recycle, upcycle section as well. So um, th those are basically the two sections. Why mohair? Well, because it's an Eastern Cape thing and um, it was all, it was, it's a glamorous fiber. And I just believe that if we were going to put so much effort into um, the labor into making and creating, we used, we needed to put it into a really upmarket and fancy uh, yarn. So I've always gone for the best quality and mohair was readily available. So that was one of the reasons why. Why put so much work into an inferior quality item? How do you source your mohair to ensure that you use the best quality? Well, I, in actual fact, there are two uh, processing plants in the Eastern Cape, Port Elizabeth and in and Newton Hague or whatever it is now. And um, th they, they process the mohair. But when you... Uh, me as a as a purchaser I sign a contract with the suppliers mm -hmm. and then the contract includes what quality I'm looking for so I would then make that deal with those people and then pay the price accordingly mm -hmm. so that's how I can be sure I get the right thing and of course Mohe South Africa now and the whole Mohe industry has gone to this traceable um, method of knowing, you know, that all the people involved are, are doing the right thing. Um, so, so that has been overcome these days. So I know I can get good quality mohair all the time. But you also use other natural fibers. Tell us more. I do use wool. I use quite a lot of wool. Um, lovely merino wool so not so much in the knitting and the finished products but in the creation of some of the yarns I mix them with mohair um, I think also just to give it a little bit of stability um, in, in, in the whole product and um, I use it a lot in um, mixes so I also do I make something called a linen mix which would be linen and mohair and bamboo and then I do a mohair and bamboo and with the lurex, which is artificial fiber, but it only forms about 3% of the of finished product. So those are the main ones that we use. I haven't gone into silk uh, with the mohair. It's, it's, it's super popular everywhere, but I, I don't want to make what everybody else is making. So I'll leave it to the others. How does your business contribute to job creation and ultimately to the well-being of your local community? Well, um, 
what we have done, it, it was a definite choice that we made was to go the handmade route. So every item goes through about 12 pairs of hands. So we employ women who have, a lot of them have very minimal skills when they join us so that they can learn on the job um, and they can wind wool and brush the fluffy project. And some of them can do the crochet. So there are some very skilled ladies. Um, so but we have jobs for all skills level and we are able to employ local women um, because they can walk to the farm and some of them come with a taxi. And it has um, a major impact on the district because living in a farming area, there's not a lot of job opportunities for women. Mm -hmm. And so it's working in the fields, the pineapple fields, or working in the pineapple fields. <laughs> um, this is a, a really is great in terms of job creation and um, creating opportunity for people in a very um, in an area with such high employment unemployment before we say goodbye are you where you want to be or are you looking at expanding the business oh uh, no I think <laughs> I think we're just scratching the surface I think there's there's huge opportunity everywhere and I and I look forward to uh, younger people getting involved in the business and, um, you know, taking it further because at the moment uh, and all through COVID, we've survived only on our overseas market because, of course, there's been no tourism in South Africa. So we've had no local market um, that can support us. So it's only been overseas. And um, overseas, you have the opportunity to grow it because Mohe is warm, it's luxurious. People have um, the climate in Denmark and Scandinavia and all those places. We send absolutely all over the world, Japan, Canada, you know, wherever you think about it, um, we have product going there. And I think that size the limit. It's just a question of having enough hours in the day to reach as much as you can. And, and so I look forward to the expansion of it and hand knitting and handmade items are coming back in vogue, that slow movement, um, ethical movement where you don't have hundreds of uh, polyester jerseys, you have one or two really beautiful items. And um, that's part of the world trend at the moment is, you know, is to, to treasure the good things and to invest in the good things. And so I just feel we're right at the stage where we can just go get a lot bigger. Yeah. Adele Cutton chatting to us about her mohair business. Al die boere wat die program gevolg het, daar rukkie terug met die afgekom dat ek dit gesê, soja kan een beetje aan die gang kom, en nou ja, het hy nie aan die gang gekom nie, hy het prachtig begin het presteer, en Ek wil eindelijk vir die boere wat ook nou nie technische ontdeling baie goed volg nie, kyk hier die prachtige, amper kan die mens sê, kantelkers, doujie, kyk hy groot te boon toe en onder toe. Maar die groot vraag is, soja is nou aan die gang, maar nou wil ek net vir die boere wees, om verder te hard op na boe, moet soja, en ek kyk nou na die nabije, nabije contract toe, moet soja boe, 7354, hy moet daar boe beweeg, om om een verder, verder momente na boonte te gee. Maar ek wil vir boere sê, ek hou iets op in die sachte commoditeitsmarkte. Voor en vroeger het jy vir 6-7 maanden terug, het jy nooit gekry dat die, die prijs is ek een groot gapings maak nie. Dis daar is omtrent elke dag een gaping, kyk net hier. Daar is een gaping, uh, daar jy nie is gelukkig gesluit, daar is een gaping, daar is een gaping, daar is een gaping, kyk net oorral sy sal gapings, en dit sê nie vir jou dat handelaars is baie onzeker. So ek wil vir boere sê, as jy nou in sachte communiteite betrokken is, en jy het een product gekoop of verkoop, en jy wil wins wat, of wat ook al, moet nie huiver nie, want hierdie, hierdie vensters wat hulle maak, hierdie gapings, gaan een of ander tyd ons ontvang, en hulle allemaal gaan of sluit, of baie nabie aan sluit, so wees net versichtig, maar soja kan nog verder gaan, as hy lekker aan die gang kom, as hy nou hierdie kanaal na boon toe breek, kom ek gee die tyking 7504, daar die venster is 7670, en hy kan ook sluit by 7756, 
Maar moet niet gierig wees nie, as hy onder 7280 kom, daar hy tuin vensterkie, kan jy bekommer draak, hy kan ook net vir jou verbaas na onder toe. Al besoek gerust ons webtuiste www.fransekler.com en ons gesels weer. Wat is die meest ingewikkelde bedrijf op aarde? Dis nie big data nie. Dis nie commoditeite of spekulering nie. Dis nie genetika of moleculaire biologie nie. Dit is nie die sale van academia nie. Of die gange van finansies nie. Dit is nie meteorologie nie. En dit is nie logistiek nie. Dit is een onderneming wat al hierdie bezighede saamvat. Dit is boerderij. En ons is trots om saam met generaties van Suid-Afrikaanse boere in die komplekse en lodende bedrijf op aarde te werk. Pioneer, gemaakt om te groei. Clinton Frey excelled for the second year in a row in the Grow for Gold competition with his Sawyers and this year a yield of 5,40 tons per hectare. He joins me now from uh, KwaZulu Natal. Clinton, tell us about the farm. So yeah, uh, farm just outside of Winterton um, in KwaZulu Natal. Um, born and bred um, on the farm, grew up on the farm. Um, my late father passed away eight years ago and basically took over and um, carrying on. So what do you farm with? On the summer crops, um, we're doing maize and soyas. And in winter, we're doing uh, wheat and potatoes. Mm-hmm. As far as I can remember, the Winterton area is known for its successful maize production. Has soya always been part of that area? So soya has always been planted in the area. Um, maize is obviously a strong point, but uh, soya has always been here as an alternative crop uh, to maize. And um, the, the prices at the moment are quite good. Um, yields as well obviously have uh, increased with the different varieties. Uh, that, so we, we're happy um, about that. How do you compare with the average yield in that area? We look, it all depends on, uh, on the area that you're in and obviously on rain. So um, it's very difficult to compare. We obviously uh, like to concentrate on on our farm average more than worrying about our neighbors. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's basically at the end of the day, um, what it's like. Um, Yield is obviously, you've got to find the right variety um, for your farm and uh, get the rain at the right time on the drylands. And um, obviously Eskim now with all the load shedding and that with the irrigation has become a a big problem with it for us. Um, But um, yeah, it's farming at the end. So how do you overcome that challenge? Well, we've put uh, VSDs in um, that start up again when once the training comes on, on, on some of the pumps and that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's an art me. I mean, we've got to get up at all hours and, and go and start pumps again. So, Why do you prefer Pioneer for your soya seed? Look, we've got a good relationship with the Pioneer guys and... Um, I think that's, I mean, farming is all about relationships and uh, the guys come around and look and see what's what. And obviously we have a look at what's, what the new varieties are that's, that's come through and we do our own farm trials and uh, see what works for us in the different populations. And uh, Pania works uh, for us. So, I mean, uh, what also works for us might not work for our neighbors. So... It's what you what works for you on your farm is what you got to plant. As I mentioned earlier, you also did very well in 2020. So obviously you are doing something right. Two years in a row. So what does this say to you? Look, it's uh, it's difficult. I think you've got to get uh, all the small things right. If you can tick all the small boxes. Um, you'll take the big box to the bottom at the end. And uh, from equip 
equipment uh, right through. I mean, to the car planting, to to everything. So if you can get everything correct, um, get your soil conditions right, um, your liming, your pHs, all the rest of that, um, all the small boxes, as I said, that uh, contributes to the bottom. And those were the words from Clinton Frey, who excelled this year once again in his soya production in KwaZulu-Natal in the Winterton area with a yield of 5,40 tonnes per hectare. Pioneer. Gemaal om te groei. What does it take to be a farmer? It takes rising while the world slumbers. It takes a strong back and even stronger gut. It takes faith in the unpredictable. Knowledge that the steps are hard, but the hectares are beautiful. It also takes courage for the unexplored, bravery to forge new frontiers, expertise in weather data and the ability to take apart an eight-cylinder engine never hurt either. That's what it takes to be a pioneer. The world doesn't understand that you're a scientist, engineer, carpenter and CEO. But we do. At Pioneer, we have 93 years of trailblazing innovation. Our high-performance seeds have adapted with the changing world. They've not just changed farmers' lives, but everyone in the world's lives. We know that knowledge of digital agriculture, business decisions, and predictive weather patterns isn't a luxury anymore. It's a necessity. It is what it takes to leap your farm into the modern era. Whilst our world grows, our weather shifts, and our earth transforms. Pioneer. Made to grow.